subscribe now and press the bell icon. Never miss an update. Welcome you all to today's session. Today's interactive session on esophageal disorders. Before this, starting that discussion about the disease of the esophagus, first we revised the anatomy of the esophagus. Because without knowing the anatomical knowledge, you don't able to understand what is the level where is the lesion? What is the level of the lesion is without knowing the knowledge of anatomy, you don't able to understand which is the level of the esophagus. So anatomy of the esophagus, it is a fibromuscular tube. The length is 25 centimeter, occupying the posterior mediastinum, extending from the upper esophageal sphincter, that means cricopharyngeus muscle, to the cardia of the stomach. 2 cm of this tube lies below the diaphragm. So the esophagus is started from the cricopharyngeal junction and ended at the intraabdominal part, ended at the fundus of the stomach. So the part lying behind the diaphragm, uh, below the diaphragm, it is about 2 cm in length. So the total length is 25 cm. The esophagus is divided into three parts. One is cervical part, thoracic part, and abdominal part. The portion of the esophagus lies in the neck in front of the cervical vertebra. It is called the cervical part. The length is 4 cm. Extend from the lower part of the cricoid cartilage to the superior border of the menubrum sternum. This thoracic part is about 2 cm. Extend from the superior border of the menubrum sternum to the esophageal opening in the diaphragm. And the abdominal part is one to two centimeter length, extend from the esophageal opening of the diaphragm to the cardiac end of the stomach. So these are the three parts of the esophagus. The esophagus during migration from the neck to the chest and abdomen, during its course, it having a two anteroposterior curvature and two lateral curvature. The anteroposterior curvature corresponding the thoracic and uh, cervical and thoracic vertebra, and to side to side curvature, both on the left side, both on the left side. When it passes the trachea, when it passes the hiatus of the diaphragm, in that case, it is a lateral curvature develop. So there is some constriction of the esophagus. These are the anatomical narrowing of the esophagus measured from the upper incisor tip. It is very important thing is, we measured the endoscopic measurement done or whenever you put the rice tube, the measurement of the length is extended from the upper incisor tip. That means we Measured from the upper incisor teeth, not into the lower incisor, because the lower incisor teeth is mobile, but upper incisor teeth is fixed. For that reason, the lengthening length is measured from the upper incisor teeth. So there are three constrictions measured: 15, 25, and 40 centimeters from the upper incisor teeth. The length of the esophagus is 25 centimeters, but the measurement is measured from the nostril, uh, the upper incisor teeth level is the 15, 25, and 40. That means from the cricoparian junction to the upper incisor teeth, the distance is 20, 15 centimeter. So that 15 centimeter is added along, then started the esophageal length. So whenever an endoscope at that level, it is 40 centimeter. Whenever it is in the middle of the esophagus, it is about 40 centimeter. So that 40 centimeter means the lesion lies in the esophagus about 20 centimeter. Uh, 10, 10 to 50 centimeter below. That means minus the 15 centimeter from the total length of the endoscope. So it is very important thing. The endoscopic level is 25 centimeter. That means 
the lesion lies at the 10 cm of the esophagus because that 15 cm is not the part of the esophagus. It is above the cricoparyngeal junction, from the cricoparyngeal junction to the upper incisor distance. So for that reason, the length is more whenever they describe the endoscopic findings, the esophageal lesion is about 25 centimeter from the upper incisor teeth or 40 centimeter from the upper incisor teeth. If it is 40 centimeter from the upper incisor teeth, it indicates it is just at the end of the esophagus, the lower end of the esophagus. So that things must be clear. If you don't understand, you don't clarify the level of obstruction of the esophagus subsequently. So there are three constrictions, constriction measured 15, 25, and 40 centimeter from the upper incisor teeth. So these constrictions have a great importance. That is, it becomes difficult to pass the endoscope. Not too much difficult, to some extent it becomes. Because in front there is a trachea, in front there is a aorta, in front there is a larynx. So for that reason they are passing there, there is some pressure if it is there, for this reason the constriction is there. It becomes difficult to pass the endoscope, even swallowed for anybody, may be stuck at these sides. The composition of the esophagus, that means the musculature of the esophagus, here having a special configuration, the upper third is composed of by stratified muscles. The lower third is, is composed of smooth muscle. And the middle that is the mixed, that means tighter muscle and smooth muscles. So this is the basic difference in, in comparison to the other parts of the gut. And it has two sphincter, one in the upper esophageal sphincter, that means cricopharyngeal muscle. It is an anatomical sphincter produced by the stridor muscle, cricopharyngeal muscles. That sphincter takes part in important role for that reason, we can easily swallow, we can easily take respiration, etc. Whenever you take mouth, anything in the mouth, so it pushes to the oropharynx, and from the oropharynx, you can the hypopharynx and ultimately go into the esophagus. So during that deglutition, that lung is pushed, epiglot is closed, sphincter is relaxed, so the food materials go down below the esophagus. For that reason, you are normally it remains constricted to prevent the entry of air into the esophagus and prevent the regurgitation of the esophageal contents to the respiratory tract, that means larynx. So normally it occluded, so that, that constriction causing prevention of air ingestion there and, uh, and prevention of regurgitation of food materials from the esophagus to the larynx. Then lower esophageal sphincter. It is a physiological sphincter. It is not an anatomical sphincter, it is a physiological sphincter formed by the asymmetrical arrangement of the muscle fiber in the distal esophagus, esophageal wall, just above the esophagastic junctions. So, the esophageal muscle distributions and the stomach muscle distributions is a little bit different. Whenever they're changing the direction of the muscle fibers, it, that muscle fiber acts as a physiological sphincter. So, it is called the lower esophageal sphincter. So the muscle fibers in the distal esophageal wall, just above the esophagogastric junction, the normal lower esophageal sphincter is three to four centimeter length, pressure about 10 to 25 centimeter, millimeter of mercury. 10 to 25 millimeter of mercury in normal individual. The pressure of the lower sphincter is 10 to 20, 25 millimeter of mercury. So this is about the anatomy of esophagus. Now, we can discuss to some symptoms of esophageal disorder. So in a normal individual, whenever he or she takes some food in the mouth, whenever it passes the pharynx, go into esophagus, we are, don't ascertain where it goes. Where it runs, we don't know, because there is no sensation. Uh, in the esophagus, middle and lower part, there is no sensation how the food is passes from up to down and migrated. We are not accustomed, we are not uh, alarmed, we are not oriented. So it is unnoticed. Next part, last part of the degradation, it become unnoticed. So whenever that degradation is recognized by the person, 
then it is say there is a difficulty in degradation. So which is called that dysphasia, which is called dysphasia. That means difficulty in duplication. Odinophasia means painful degradation. He knows that something is going down. He can notice, it, but there is no pain. If along with the pain, then it is called the odinophasia. What about the reflux? That means coming back. Passive return of gastrointestinal contents to the mouth is a part of the symptomatology of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Previously, which is called the gastroesophageal spelling is E. Now it is some book written G O. It is American and British terminology. There is to some extent different. Somebody writing is the G E R D. Somebody is writing G O R D. That means whenever the food materials come back from the stomach to the esophagus, it is called the reflux. Regurgitation, return of esophageal contents from above a functional or mechanical obstruction. Whenever there is a mechanical obstruction in the pyloric end, suppose, so the food may stay there and cause the back pressure effect and come it up, it is called the regurgitation. And some presentation is the chest pain, difficult to distinguish from cardiac pain. Retroesternal pain may present it with esophageal disorder. What are the causes of dysphagia? It is divided into extramural, intramural, intraluminal. And another one is the functional one. So extramural means the lesion is lies outside the wall and causing the pressure effect, which causing the luminal uh, obstruction and causing the dysphagia. So that are the, the structure which lies around the esophagus in the mediastinum the lesion of that organs produces the pressure effect and causes the symptom. This is the extramural causes. So the, in the mediastinum, a lot of lymph nodes lies in, around the esophagus. So if any lymph nodes enlarge, other than esophageal lesions, lung lesions, or mediastinal uh, thymic lesions or other lesions, any malignant lesions, which causing the lymph nodes enlarge, surrounding the esophageal lymph nodes enlarge, causing the pressure effect. That pressure effect is noticed as a dysphagia. So for that reason, they are written there, medicinal nodes, secondaries, or lymphoma, or tuberculosis. Some aortic aneurysm. In a normal aorta, there is no aneurysm. There is, that means no dilatation of any part of the aorta. Whenever it is dilated in all of the aorta, it is called the aneurysm. So the dilatation, causing occupy the medicinal space. So it causing the pressure repeat over the esophagus and causing the dysphagia. Rolling type of hiatus hernia. That means the rolling type. That means whenever the fundus is entered inside the esophageal hiatus, it probably produces a pressure repeat there. So it is not directly over the lumen. So the lesion periphery of the fundus is go up and pressure repeat over the esophagus and causing the effect which is called the extra moral causes of dysphagia. Thyroid enlargement, particularly in case of malignant one, in benign lesion is really not any dysphagia noticed. But whenever the malignant lesions, in that case is directly or by lymph node enlargement, they're causing the pressure to over the esophagus and may patient present with the dysphagia. Dysphagia lusoria is an abnormal condition characterized by difficulty in swallowing caused by an aberrant right supplement. If there is the extra aberrant vessels in the supplement artery, so one artery is in front, one artery is behind, so both the artery and trap the esophagus. So during any degradation, the foot metals may stuck there and causing the symptom, which is called the dysphagia. The another one, congenital anomalies and mediastinitis or mediastinal mass. So that are the causes of extramural causes of dysphagia. What about the intramural? So intramural one. Whenever the lesion lies in the wall, commonly is the carcinoma esophagus, first to solid, then to liquid. It is the main important thing is. The carcinoma esophagus, the dysphagia presentation is, the patient present to you, the initially I noticed that there is difficult degradation in the solid food, but nowadays, liquid food also become difficult to degradate. 
so initially solid then liquid it is most likely representation of dysphagia pattern is carcinoma esophagus but in some cases of cardia, the presentation of dysphagia is different here is not the both liquid it is not the dysphagia of the solid fast here dysphagia is really fast liquid then solid or sometimes both of the both of the solid and liquid can notice from very beginning so it is a basic difference between the carcinoma esophagus and a calicia cardia. The other causes are corrosive. That means if a patient having some corrosive ingestion, like a heartbeat, nowadays it's more common, heartbeat suicidal tendency, ingestion suicidal tendency is common, that heartbeat causing the chemical burning of the esophagus and ultimately the ulceration, ulcer is subsequently healed and become narrowed, which causing the luminal narrowing and the presentation is dysphagia. Or the patient having a tuberculosis of the esophagus, the patient is treated with the anti-tubercular drug, the tubercular lesions, ulcers become healed, scarring and narrowing of the lumen and presented as a dysphagia. So the lesion is lies in the wall of the esophagus. Or an inflammatory condition or congenital esophageal structure, it also presented with a dysphagia. And another one is, Gastroesophageal reflux disease. The sphincter, a lot of sphincter is not working properly. So the food materials go up to the esophagus. So the acidic content go up in the esophagus, which causing there is a ulcerations and subsequent there is teacher formations. Palmer Vinson syndrome, whenever the depression is the iron deficiency anemia, so it's commas epithelium become the epithelial lining become more dry, and there is there is a there is a difficulty to degradation noticed in case of palmar pinson syndrome iron deficiency anemia in that case scleroderma this is a systemic disease of collagen tissue it can deposit the collagen fibrous tissue in any of the organs whenever it involves the esophageal wall the presentation of the scleroderma or the patient is dysphagia and another one intraluminal cause Suppose a patient having accidentally can ingest a coin or the denture or a fish bone or a meat bolus is stuck in the esophagus. So the lumen is narrowed, the patient presented as a dysphagia. Usually both, all of their things are causing dysphagia whenever there is associated with other diseases like stricture due to malignant one or benign stricture, maybe in previous unnoticed they are in that case, it is more markedly present. Then other functional causes are, if a patient having a stroke, so whenever there is a stroke, there is a central nervous system is not work properly. So without central nervous system function, the whole body is not run properly. For that reason, the stroke patient presented to you as a dysphagia. Cerebral palsy, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, globus hystericus. These are the causes of functional dysphagia. So what are the diseases may develop in the esophagus? So the diseases are divided into some are congenital one. So that congenital disease is tracheoesophageal fistula. So that tracheoesophageal fistula usually is a congenital one. During developmental process, there is a foreguard, there is a pouching, that is again divided and forms the respiratory tract and the and the esophageal tract. So both are communicated to each other, may develop tracheoesophageal fistula. Or sometimes the patient having esophageal estasia, that means the upper end of the esophagus is occluded, developmentally is blindly, blindly ended, so there is esophageal estasia. So this is the congenital cause. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, hiatus hernia, esophageal motility disorder, that are Echalicia cardia, another name is cardiospasm. Sometimes in the short note, maybe present cardiospasm or echalicia cardia, but that is both the name, both the name must know. It is inadequate lower esophageal spin relaxation, diffuse esophageal spasm, uncoordinated cord contraction, and other are esophageal carcinoma, esophageal structure, esophageal perforation. So let me discuss one by one subsequently. So what are the investigations are done for esophageal disorder? So the two radiological investigations are common one. 
one is plain x-ray another one is contrast x-ray so that plain x-ray is usually done in case of foreign body whenever you suspect the patient having ingest history of ingestion of foreign body for localization we do a plain x-ray chest ap and lateral view by the two x-rays we can evaluate, easily evaluate is the respiratory tract or is in this vagal tract like is where tubes and other uh, plain x is important in case of achalasia cardia so we can discuss later on the chapter of achalasia cardia what are the findings of plain x chest in case of achalasia cardia then about the contrast x that contrast x is very important it is mainly diagnosed the etiology of the dysphagia for evaluation the whenever the contrast agent are ingested it runs through the esophagus lumen from the mouth to the esophagus then go to the stomach so during the migration of the contrast the film is taken which can easily delineate the mucosa of the esophagus and also the caliber of the esophagus and the part about the lower end shape of the esophagus all the information can guess by looking at the barium solo x ray of the esophagus <coughs> in that barium solo in contrast to the barium solo one thing is one thing everybody knows what is the difference between the barium solo and barium mill so barium solo that means something is solo so in that case is needed the during transit of food materials through the esophagus is slowly go down so if it is runs slowly you can easily take the picture for that aim in case of barium solo the barium is made a paste not a milk if you make a milk and ingested the patient whenever you ingest you ask the patient start swallowing then rapidly go down you don't able to take the picture properly for that reason in case of barium solo the solo materials is barium paste just like a toothpaste it appears just like a toothpaste so it can move slowly migrated from through the esophagus easily take the x-ray x -ray, stay the esophagus easily delineate the mucosa the x-ray picture is good for that reason the term is used barium swallow x-ray so that swallow ingested material is this is the paste but in case of barium mill our aim to identify the stomach not the esophagus for that reason the more amount of volume is needed we we can ingest the patient with the barium milk that means barium mixed with the water just like a milk more liquid in nature not a paste like so more volume is needed so for that reason barium mill x ray is composed of water with barium that means barium suspension so this is the basic thing it needs to know everybody sometime ask in the exam what about the endoscopy the term is written there endoscopy oblique esophagus whenever you direct only looking the esophagus then it is called the esophagus whenever you go for the esophagus and the stomach so then uh, the equation is written there endoscopy of upper gastrointestinal tract upper gi tract git that means upper gastrointestinal tract that means by upper gastrointestinal tract examination by an endoscope you can look the esophagus you can look the stomach you can look the duodenum after the second part so this is called the upper gastrointestinal endoscopy of upper gastrointestinal tract esophagus could be particularly written whenever the rigid esophagus could be is done for the disease process like a foreign body or a, some biopsy previously is is more oriented a custom because the flexible endoscope are not available not available in our country to here and there for that reason the rigid esophagus could be is more used in the thoracic surgery but nowadays the rigid esophagus could be used is declined because for rigid esophagus could be always needed to do a general anesthesia but in case of flexible endoscopy no need of general anesthesia the surface anesthesia or some sedation is sufficient to do the endoscopy the other investigation is endoluminal ultrasonography it is one source of ultrasonography that means the probe is lies inside the esophagus so the esophagus lumen contained a probe sensor it can carry the information from the side of the sensor to the monitor so easily delineate the layer by layer of the esophagus what are the infiltration of the malignancy 
whole thickness or part of the thickness, whatever the surrounding lymphonode status, more delineately, they delineately evaluated. For that reason, nowadays, it is taken upper end where it is available, but it is not available all of the country. Very limited center is available in our country, only one center, which is Mangamundu Sheikh Modi Medical University and in the Green Life Hospital. Other, no other center there, there is the endoscopy, ultrasound, endoromal ultrasound is not available. So our common is normal ultrasound. By normal ultrasound probe, it is not possible to evaluate from the chest. Why? Because the air is the enemy of the ultrasonography probe. Whenever there is the air, the sound is not passed properly, does not take the picture images. For that reason, esophagus is not evaluated by normal ultrasonal superficial proof or abdominal proof, etc. For that reason, endonomial ultrasonography is better to evaluate the lesion of the esophagus. And another one is helps in tumor staging in case of esophageal cancer. What about the esophageal manometry? This is important because manometry means pressure measurement. The measurement of the pressure, the luminal pressure is measured by a sensor, is put through the mouth, through the nose, go to the esophagus at the lower end. In the monitor, they can make the measure, uh, they take the measurement of the monitor pressure. There is graphical representation. From the graphs, they can easily look what is the pressure of the esophageal lower end. The resting pressure is very important to diagnose the motility disorder. By placing the manometer probe, you can evaluate the patient having any esophageal motility present or not. If there is a, if a if esophageal, no, esophageal motility is absent, so you are more suspected that the patient may having a cardia. Or if the patient having a lower sphincter pressure is high, so it is more suspected that the patient may having esophageal achalasia cardia. So the diagnosis of motility disorder and location, length, and pressure relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter can be determined. So another one is 24 hours pH combined with pH impedance recording. So <clears throat> there is a sensor in the esophagus. So by the sensor, they can take the pH measurement of the lower end of the esophagus. So if there is a pH changes, that can evaluate the patient having a reflux is whether it is or not. So gold standard diagnosis of gastrovesical reflux. It means pH measurement of the esophagus. Intraluminal pH measurement. A small pH probe is placed 5 cm above the lower esophagus sphincter. pH change recorder over 24 hours. And another one is CT chest. <clears throat> this is an important one. CT scan chest. Useful investigation in case of neoplasm of the esophagus. It can easily delineate the esophagus, delineate the other medicinal structures, delineate the infiltrations, delineate the metastatic lymphoid status, and evaluate what is the length of the lesion also. They can, it, can, it can easily evaluate the, is the infiltration of the trachea, is the infiltration of the bronchus, they can easily evaluate it by doing a CT scan. But in case of endoscopy, but the latest conception is nowadays the corona period all are more worried about the respiratory tract because most of the endoscopists they are don't interested to go for the endoscopy but in future nowadays it is also available in the western countries but in our country one or two centers is available which is called the which is called the capsule endoscope so in that case is ingested a capsule in the mouth Go to the mouth, go to the esophagus, and run through the intestine. And there is a cordless sensor over the waist, which is recorded by images within every every minute, having four or five or six images can be given there to the recorder. And after 24 hours <coughs> or uh, 12 hours, when the capsule is expelled out through the feces, then it is collected. And from the wall of the capsule, is there any mucosa sent for histopathological examination? So it also takes upper and in future. But capsule endoscopy, it also a very important for investigations. But in the esophagus, it is not too much useful because the evaluation are not too much possible 
by doing encapsular endoscopy because it does not take time to go down. It can go rapidly and evaluation is very difficult. In case of upper GI endoscopy, particularly the achalasia cardia, the direct flexible endoscope is needed. But for other investigation of the GI tract, the capsule endoscopy also takes part in future, if it is available. What about the gastroesophageal reflux disease, GORD, sometimes in the short note in the exam. So it looks the picture, this is stomach. Whenever we ingest something, during ingestions, along with the food, some amount of air migrated by migrated through the esophagus to the stomach. Whenever the footballers go into the stomach, the air is free and go into the fundus. For that reason, in the fundic gas, we look, there is a fundic gas there. The footballer is in the blue. So that fundic gas is come from the isobagus along with the food materials during ingestions. But look here, whenever there is a reflux, that means the food materials go up, go back to the isobagus. So that greenish food materials go into the isobagus. That is representation of the reflux disease. So introduction, gastroesophageal reflux is the retrograde movement of the gastric contest into the, into the esophagus. Retrograde movement of the gastric contest into the esophagus. From the stomach to the esophagus, yellowish food materials. There are two types of gastroesophageal reflex. One is physiological, another one is pathological. Physiological one, Whenever you take more amount of fluid too much, then the food materials is overfilled the stomach. So in that case, the gas is pushed up. Along with the gas, some amount of food materials go up. It is called the postprandial. It is not all the time happen, particularly whenever you take the massive amount of bolus food materials intake. In that case, there is chance of reflux, which is called the physiological one. And short, it is short-lived. That means not too much, little bit amount. Asymptomatic. There is no pain probably there. No nocturnal symptoms. That means at night, there is a no heart burn. So it is called the physiological GORD. It is conscious, usually consciously occurred. Whenever you arouse at that time, particularly after a happy meal. But in case of pathological one, that means there is some functional disturbance there which causing the hold of the food materials to the stomach. So in that case the symptoms is more and there is a mucosal injury because prolonged repeated exposure of the AC to the esophagus causing ulcerations and during sleep the patient may arouse due to the heartburn because the acidic materials go into the esophagus and causing the more symptoms. So the pathological GORD is differentiated mainly by the nocturnal symptoms one. The clinical features. The clinical classical, classic triad of symptoms. That means the acid is come up causing the burning. There is, there is a burning of the tissues. So there is a mucosal ulceration. For that is the pain, retrosternal burning pain. Epigastric pain sometimes radiating through to the back and degradations. Something food materials go up into the superficial mouth, it is called the regurgitation. Most patients do not experience all three. Symptoms are often provoked by food, particularly those they delay gastric emptying, which means fats and spicy foods. Besides the clinical symptoms, excessive salivation due to exposure of the esophagus to acid water brush is also a common symptom. Extra esophageal symptoms, that is atypical symptoms, cough, squeezing, hoarseness. Cough means whenever the foot is go into the respiratory tract, so the patient having a cough there, squeezing, hoarseness, sore throat, and non cardiac chest pain, palatal and dental erosions in long standing cases. Whenever more acid content migrated up and repeatedly exposed to the mouth, 
in that cases there is a chance of palatal and dental erosions in long studied cases investigations it is important one is 24 hours ph recording it is very important one it is a gold standard investigation so the sensor is applied through the nose to there 24 hours is stay there and there's a, a monitor is there so attached to the monitor so it can record what about the ph every 20 minutes 10 minutes 50 minutes interval and record it, it, it records are evaluated and subsequently the result this is the gold standard investigation for gastroesophageal reflux disease diagnosis and upper GI endoscopy bio and biopsy for diagnosis of reflux esophageitis, stricture, parasitosis, etc. And esophageal manomet. It is also important rule. What is the tone? What is the pressure of the lower sphincter? And barium swallow in tendon and bar position. It is very important one more. Because if you take the, you do the barium swallow. And after that, do an X-ray. During the X-ray, so food metals go down. So you don't double down diagnose that there is a regurgitation. So whenever the patient having a, a GORD, then the materials go down, and in tenderer position, patient put place. That means the head is down, leg is up. So if the food materials are back into the esophagus, then it is called the very uh, Then the Diagnosis is GORD. But what about the treatment of the GORD? Whenever the symptoms are mild, firstly, you can conservatively treat the patient. So the conservative treatment is medical management. That means lifestyle modification. So that lifestyle modification is the nature of the food, the nature of the clothing, Oh, and etc. You can change, you can control the disease. That means if you, if the patient is fatty, so when they are the more fat they are, so the fat, it, the fat also deposited in and around the esophagus. So it causing the esophageal hiatus become enlarges and which causing there is the incompetency of the esophageal warrant and causing reflux of the food content to the esophagus. And if you if you put a tight belt in the abdomen, so it's causing the increased intraabdominal pressure. So if you loosen the belt, that means the abdominal pressure will relax, then there is less chance of reflux. And if the patient is lying in a propped up position or a two bed, two pillow behind the head, in that case, there is chance of less amount of regurgitations. That means less amount of GORD symptom. And if the patient is having a smoking alcohol, you must omit the things, otherwise the disease is, is a more deteriorating. Avoid excessive consumption of tea and coffee. It also needed because it causing the decreased sphincter pressure. Avoidance of large meals late at night. It is a very important one. And just after take meal, you don't allow to go for to bed. So there is more chance of regurgitation in that cases. And propped up position, it is an important one has shown to have an effect that is similar to taking an S2 receptor antagonist. So you take the S2 receptor antagonist, which can decrease the acidity secretions and causing the symptom less. So it is more similar if it can achieve only by lying in a bed in a propped up position. So look, the acid exposure to the issue as causing some ulceration is there. What about the other management? The conservative one, first one is that thing. And along with it, you can prescribe some medications, antacid. That means antacid can directly neutralize the acid. So immediately can neutralize it. So if the footprint is go up to the esophagus, there's less bonding there. And proton pump in your body is most effective drug. S2 receptor antagonist, anyone you can prescribe, but better to give proton pump inhibitors. The surgical treatment. The surgical treatment is usually required when the symptom is more marked and there's development, some complication, in that cases, you need to do some surgical treatment. The aim of surgical treatment is relax the, that means the lower esophageal, the gastroesophageal junction, if it is a component more, so there is less chance of migration. So nowadays, 
It also a latest treatment is endoscopic suturing device that placate the gastric mucosa just below the cardia to accentuate the angle of his endoscopically they can die but it's a very sophisticated one so if they endoscopically the lower end is placated there so the lumen is narrowed so back reflux is less the symptom is less other is radio frequency ablation to the level of the sphincter shown to be effective for as long as 10 yards and another one is injection of submucosal polymer that means if i injected some submucosal polymers like a silicone gel injected in the mucosa so the gel causing the swelling of the mucosa so narrowing the lumen and causing the prevention of reflux from the gastric to the esophagus so with that aim injection of submucosal polymer that submucosal injection also given in case of reflux basically it is a reflux in case of children just put an endoscope there and in the opening of the basically junction within the within the submucosa push the silicon gel that can make a pressure a bit over the lower end of the esophagus the ureter and causing prevention of reflux from the bladder to the ureter same mechanism is applied there injection of submucosal polymer into the lower esophagus it can narrow the lumen and prevent the migration of gastric content to the esophagus if that minimal invasive procedure are not functioning properly or not available there in that cases you can go for some surgical options which is called the anti reflux surgeon they are all based on creation of an intra abdominal segment of esophagus crural repair that means the hiatus through the crura the esophagus is migrated so that if it is tightened there so the esophageal reflux is less and finally to maintain the intra abdominal part of the esophagus in the abdomen for that reason the fundus of the stomach is migrated behind come to the right side and wrap around the esophagus which is called the fundus placation so around the intra abdominal esophagus so it is called the fundus placation the so total that means nissen fundus placation it is very familiar Every for everybody, you must know the name. Sometimes ask in the exam. Total that means whenever it is whole wrap the issue because it is called the Nissen fund application. Whenever partial fund application is done, the another name is Trupe, which is done by open technique or by laparoscopy one. And others are Ellison repair, Hale procedure, Belsi mark for operation. These are not required for the undergraduate level. Only one is sufficient to know the Nissen fund application. Indication for anterior reflux surgery. Whenever you go for surgery, we don't go for every patient go for surgery. We go in a limited one. That means young patient who require chronic PPI. When the patient having more symptom, we taking the symptom with the PPI, which is not responding properly. So in that cases, you must need. to do the surgical treatment failure to drug treatment whenever the patient having a sliding hernia so if you have sliding hernia the drug is not control the lower esophageal sphincter mechanism so it must be done the surgical treatment patient with barrett's esophagus in that case it needs for surgical treatment whenever the patient with severe pain and presence of complication like bleeding stricture and shortening of the esophagus or some repeated respiratory infection in that case the patient must be needed to do a surgical treatment anti reflux surgery the name of it commonly done is called kind of laparoscopic knee and fund application <clears throat> so look at a glance the picture of knee and fund application look so this is the esophagus and this is the stomach so this stomach fundus is lies on the left side so from the left side the fundus is held with the forceps and migrated behind the esophagus and wrap so behind this was wrap then you make some stitches there so it can acts as a barrier and acts and prevents migration of lower end of the esophagus to the chest so it can prevents 
reflux. So whenever it's complete one, this pattern, it is called the Nissan fund of glycation. Whenever is the incomplete one, migrated there and fished not in the midline, it just lateral on side, it is called the toe pant, partial fund of glycation. So this is the picture of Nissan fund of glycation. For some people, an operation called fundoplication is an appropriate treatment for reflux. So look the video. Fundo refers to the top part of the stomach. Plicate means to fold. In this operation, a portion of the upper stomach is folded around the bottom of the esophagus and secured to support the valve. The surgeon is usually able to make a number of small incisions instead of a single large one speeding healing and recovery. However, sometimes a larger incision is required. If you have a hiatal hernia, it will be repaired at the same time. The surgeon might also tighten the hiatus, the hole through which the esophagus passes through the diaphragm. Most people who have a fundoplication enjoy long-lasting relief from the symptoms of reflux. Some factors, such as steroid medications and obesity, can cause the fundoplication to become loosened over time, resulting in a return of symptoms. In some cases, fundoplication may cause difficulty swallowing. That means whenever too tight, it causing there is dysphagia. Whenever too loose, there is a regurgitation. For that is an optimum repair is required. So this is laparoscopic picture of Heller's cardiomyopathy video. Look, we can discuss later. So the lower end of the esophagus is identified. The anterior surface of the esophagus is dissected. The muscle cord is divided. So look, apart the muscle cord, the mucosa is seen there. So the length of the division is measured with the tape. Then, the extension of the division is up to the upper end of the stomach. Otherwise, the symptoms of a calicycardia is not relieved. Then do the fund application. This is the Heller's cardiomyotomy video. What about the complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease? The esophagus, there is a repeated exposure to acid for the erosive esophagitis. So repeated attack of infection, inflammation, inflammation causing ulceration and healing it causing the stricture formation. That long segment of stricture sometimes contracted and causing the esophagus shortening. That means esophagus come up inside the thorax mode. And there is a repeated exposure of epithelial with the acid. There is a change of epithelium. So the esophagus lower end is composed of the lower end of the esophagus. The epithelial lining is the columnar. So that colonial epithelium is migrated up to protect the esophagus, which is called the Barrett's esophagus. So that Barrett's esophagus having two types, low grade and high grade dysplasia. Whenever you take the biopsy from the lower end of the esophagus, under the tissue there, if the report is low grade, then you need to the follow up and subsequently you need to the endoscopic mucosal resection. If it is high grade, in that case it is needed to go for the esophagus. So these are the treatment of Barrett's esophagus. And likely the patient may present it with a carcinoma esophagus, it may adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And extra esophageal is laryngitis, recurrent pneumonia, and progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Recurrent, there is a spiration. Bigger irritation, go to the esophagus, and ultimately enters into the mouth, uh, larynx, go to the respiratory tract. Laryngitis, recurrent pneumonia, progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So these are complications of gastroesophageal plus disease. Now we we'll discuss about the hiatus hernia. The hiatus means opening. Hernia, that means throat opening when a hernia occurs. That hiatus hernia means always we diagnose that it is the esophageal hiatus. Through the esophageal hiatus, the hernia is called the hiatal hernia. Hiatus hernia is the protrusion of the stomach upward into the medicinal cavity. Through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. 
So there is the esophageal hiatus. Though below the esophageal hiatus, the esophagus is really present. Whenever the esophagus go up, and along with the stomach go up, then it is called the hiatus hernia. There are several factors responsible for the development of this hernia. These are muscular degeneration of increasing age, increased intraepidermal pressure due to obesity, pregnancy, coughing, increase of fatty tissue in the hiatus with decreased elasticity of the crua as occurs in obese women. And once reflux is established, esophageal spasm and later even esophageal fibrosis with causing pull more and more than a stomach into the chest. That is when the esophagus is shortening, then go pull the esophagus, migrate the stomach to the chest. So these are the factors for responsible to development of hiatus hernia. There is a three types of hiatus hernia. Whenever the esophagus is directly go up, then pull the stomach to some extent, it is called the sliding hernia. But whenever the gastroesophageal junction is normal in position, but the fundus of the stomach is migrated in through the hiatus, then it is called the rolling. That means rolled and go up. Just rolled and go up. The esophageal junction remains there then it is called the rolling hernia. And some individual having both of this simultaneously present, it is called the mixed type of hiatus hernia. So commonly is sliding on 85%, 5% is peroesophageal, and mixed type is 10%. There is another type, is of type 4, which is not required for the undergraduate, in which abdominal contents, other than the stomach, the colon, or a small intestine may move upwards through the opening. Then it is called the type 4 one, which is not required for undergraduate student. Only memorize the three things is sufficient. So what about the clinical features? In case of sliding hernia, they may be asymptomatic, but usually presents with the symptoms of GORD, mainly heartburn, degradation, dysphagia. In case of periesophageal hernia, it causes more symptom because mainly due to the twisting or distortion of the esophagus and stomach. Whenever the stomach fundus is migrated through the small hole, it causes more pressure a bit there. So they can, the, pressure, the patient can present it to use the early symptom, dysphagia. Dysphagia is common and chest pain may occur from distension of the obstructed stomach, strangulation, gastric perforation, gangrene may occur because the small opening, whenever more content is there, so there is more pressure effect because ischemia, perforation, gangrene, etc. For that reason, the paraesophageal variety presented to you earlier. And complication is more. So, what about the investigation? So, chest x ray is a normal one to look is there any clinical features of pneumonitis, etc. In case of esophagus migrated up, so in there, there is stasis, there is some fluid level may be seen. And in case of barium swallow x-ray of the esophagus, it means there is a concentric mucosal narrowing, concentric mucosal narrowing at the gastroesophageal junction, which is called chagic uh, ring may be present. This is because name is specific one, concentric mucosal narrowing. An upper jaw endoscopy, it is the important investigation. An esophageal manometry, 24 hours pH recording, and CT scan of the chest to evaluate paraesophageal hernia. It is a chest x ray look in case of hiatus hernia. Whenever the whole stomach is in the chest, so look, there is a heart border there is a stomach border. So the content of the stomach causing there is a white shadow there. So a large hiatus hernia on the x-ray marked by open arrows in contrast to the hard border marked by the closed arrows. So this is the stomach migrated inside the chest and causing the findings in the x-ray chest. So barium solid look, the esophageal splinter Gastrovular junction is go up, it is a hiatus 
in the diaphragm so it is a sliding hernia but here the esophagus is there gastro junction here but the stomach is migrated up through the hiatus for then there is a constriction is there so this is called the para is a periphery of the esophagus for that reason it is called the para esophageal hernia so look whenever the endoscope put inside the stomach directly go into the antrum but whenever the endoscopy picture show the scope that means at the antrum the scope is folded 180 degree and go upwards for that reason this scope is visualized in the scenario whenever a scope is visualized that means the it the opening in the scope is the it is a gastroesophageal junction so near the gastroesophageal junction there is a protrusion of the sac there fundus go up so it indicates it is hiatus hernia but if it is, a, it is not the hiatus so in that case there is a small pocket is there in there is a big one is the fundus is look there a smooth one but here there is a small depression small pocket is there which represented that the patient having a paraesophageal hernia so doing endoscope if you look any report of the endoscope if the report of the endoscope no scope shadow that means the scope is faulty is not functioning properly this uh, endoscopist cannot visualize the properly the fundus if the if the scope is older one gradually the fiber is broken in that case the scope is not possible to bend is not possible to see the fundus most of the uh, less prominent center where the scope is older one it is not functioning properly so in that case they do not see the fundus the put the report give the report that the stomach is okay so the picture indicates that the endoscopist must see it within the picture that the scope is visualized that means he definitely observe the fundus so that scope vision is mandatory in the endoscopy report for evaluation of the fundus so treatment treatment in sliding hiatus hernia similar to the treatment of GORD gastroesophageal reflux disease similar but rolling or paraesophageal hernia the patient who present as an emergency with an acute chest pain may be initially treated by nasogastric tubes to relieve the distension that causes the pain followed by surgical repair because there is a narrowed opening of the fundus narrowed hiatus them go up causing ischemic and necrosis for that is only in that case it needed to urgent surgery if pain is not relieved or perforation is suspected immediate operation is mandatory elective surgery involves reduction of the hernia excision of the sac repair of the crawl defect some form of retention of the stomach in the abdomen that means the contents are released from the sac to the abdomen then the hernia sac is excised then the crura of the diaphragm is from the hiatus is repaired because the crura is also wider for that reason it takes repair two or three or four bites then the fundoplexion done so fundoplexion can be done which is effective means of maintaining reduction and deals with associated GORD mass reinforcement of hiatus to close the defect may be needed sometimes if the hiatus is more wider there is a more chance of recurrence for that reason, in that cases, we place some meshes there. Mesh, place a mesh, make a window of the mesh there, and encircle the esophagus and place a mesh inside the abdomen. So the mesh also prevent the migration of content to the chest. What about the calicia cardia? It is very favorite term for the cardiothoracic surgeon, general surgeons, ENT surgeons. So repeatedly asked in the exam, the written in the viva in the hospital. So what about the achalasia cardia? Achalasia cardia or cardiospasm is a motility disorder. First, you memorize the thing is the esophagus is empty by two mechanisms. One is by gravitational force, another one is by peristalsis. Because if you don't having a peristalsis so if you take the food in lying posture the 
esophageal content is not migrated to the stomach because whenever you lie, there is no gravitational force, so no effect of gravitational force there, so esophagus is not empty there. So only esophagus is empty on lying posture by peristalsis. So whenever the patient does not have any peristalsis, so there is a stasis. The esophagus is empty only by gravitational force. So in case of achalasia cardia, it is a motility disorder of the esophagus characterized by failure of relaxation of cardia. That means esophageal cardia junction is failure to relax. It is not functioning properly. Whenever there is a peristalsis, one segment is dilated, another segment is constricted. So whenever the peristalsis is migrated in the near lower end, the sphincter is relaxed. The food matrix can easily pass it to the stomach. But whenever there is a calicic cardia, there is no peristalsis in the esophagus. So there is no coordination with the esophageal peristalsis to the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. For that reason, the esophageal sphincter is constricted there. Due to the disorganized esophageal peristalsis, as a result of failure of integration of parasympathetic impulses, causing functional obstruction. Mainly, why it is occurred? Due to the absence or degeneration of orbis plexus or myentary plexus. Whenever the myentary plexus is absent, then there is a lack of peristalsis in the esophagus. There is a disorganized peristalsis there, not relaxation of the lower end, so don't be able to empty the esophagus by peristalsis. So the patient presented the symptoms of dysphagia. It is a basic conception of Achalasia cardia. What about the etiology? The etiology are, is unknown, but there is some hypothesis or some observation. In South America, there is a chronic infection with infestation with parasitic Trypanoma cruzi, causes a Chagas disease, which has marked clinical similarities of Achalasia cardia. That means Chagas disease causes damage to the nerve plexus, and the patient presented with a dysphagia and the findings should be mixed with the achalasia cardia. So some comparison you must know because that question sometimes asked in the viva or in the written, there is a short note where present what is the difference between the achalasia cardia and Hotspur disease. Both of the disease having a disorder of the peristalsis. So that disorder peristalsis, but the findings is different between the two opposite to each other. For easy memorization, the esophagus is upper, so the myentary plexus is absent in the upper part, dilated part of the esophagus. The heart sprint disease in the lower part of the guard, that means in the rectum, so or the colon or higher, so the lower is the constricted part. It is not a dilated one. The constricted part segment is absent of nerve plexus. That means in case of Hartsman disease, the nerve plexus is absent in the constricted segment. In case of Hartsman uh, cardia in the upper, so the dilated part having no myentary plexus. This is the basic difference. We remember about it. So in Echalicia cardia, the dilated esophagus contains few ganglionic cells. Few are absent. In Hartsman disease, dilated colon contains normal ganglionic cells to a constricted, that means a ganglionic segment, there is a hypertrophy of the nerve fibers also. So the constricted segment having no ganglion there. It is the diagnostic of Hartsman disease, but here the dilated segment no or less ganglion, ganglion there. So look at the picture. So it is the affected segment of the esophagus in case of achalasia cardia, ganglion myentary plexus in there, but in case of Hartsman disease, the constriction segment having no not fiber. So this is the basic difference between the two similar diseases. Only remember is esophagus is upper, so upper part is ganglionic. But in case of rectum, it is lower, so the lower part is ganglionic. It is the basic to easy learn, easy memorize the term. Some comparison with other diseases like echalasia cardia with a scleroderma. In case of achalasia cardia, the sphincter is not relaxed and there is a stasis of the foot matrix in the dilated segment. But in case of scleroderma, the esophagus is dilated, but there is a collagen deposition in the wall, which causing the lower end of the esophagus 
is not is not constricted there. But in case of a scleroderma, there is a peristalsis there. So the clinical findings of the patient is scleroderma is a collagen tissue, is systemic disease for their deposition throughout the body, which is characterized by dysphagia, thickened shiny skin, and blue finger. That two important findings is very important to evaluate and differentiate the diseases. And the upper dilated portion of the esophagus still has peristalsis. It is a very important thing. The scleroderma patient present with dysphagia also, but there is still has peristalsis. And there is usually a hiatus hernia with a widely patterned free reflux in gastroesophageal functions. So this is the differentiating point. And if you do an X-ray, dying, ingest the barium and standing the patient, immediately get get empty. But in case of echelacea cardia, is not empty properly. So clinical features common in the young age of both sexes: progressive dysphagia, initially liquid, then solid, ultimately bone. It is a cardinal symptom. Regurgitation of undigested food materials, particularly at night, and fullness after meal in retroesternal or epigastric area, discomfort or pain in the retroesternal area due to the esophagitis, and loss of weight lately. So, say fullness and retroesternal pain, these symptoms causing some changes in the esophagus and changes in the lungs. So, what investigation to evaluate the diseases? For that reason, you do a plain x-ray. If you do a plain x-ray of chest, that plain x-ray can suspect you that the patient having, there is a stasis of the foot in the esophagus, so that causing the stasis of the foot is there, so do an x-ray, look, there is a fluid level there. So that fluid level indicates that there is some food material there and above there is air. Some people say it is air fluid level, but air fluid level is a wrong nomenclature. Always it is fluid level because without air there is no fluid level. Look at the picture of the bottle. There is no air, so there is no fluid level is there. But whenever the air with the fluid, then represent the fluid level. So your answer is, correct answer is the fluid level. So that fluid level causing there is some food materials and above there is air. So that type of, in case of plain x in the mediastinum, you look there is a fluid level, it indicates some esophageal obstruction is there, one. Second thing is, there are repeated stasis of the food materials causing aspiration and causing pneumonitis. Features of pneumonitis also find in the chest x-ray. So chest x-ray, there is a double mediastinal strip or dilated esophagus is a typical with fluid level in posterior mediastinum on lateral view. Or simple plain X sometimes looks carefully, you can observe there is a fluid level there. The others are barium swallow X of the esophagus. So that swallow can visualize the dilated esophagus with barred beak appearance or pencil tip appearance of lower end, proximal segment dilated with tapering distal lower end of the esophagus. And it is an absence of fundy gas bubble. It is important one. It is plain X ray chest also can dictate. There is no gas bubble because if there is no peristalsis, so the food materials, whenever passes by forcefully with the peristalsis, in that case, it's only the air mixed with fluid go to the fundus. But in case of achalasia, the food materials is go down only by the gravitational force. There is no pressure effect there. For that reason, the gas is always up, never ever migrated through the isobagus to the stomach. For that reason, there is the absence of fundic gas is most likely the patient may having a, having a calicia cardia. It is very important finding tips. In long-standing cases, the esophagus is more dilated. It takes the shape of the sigmoid. For that reason, it is called the sigmoid esophagus, sometimes seen in the late presentation of the calicia cardia. And other investigations are esophageal manometry, a gold standard one, failure to relax the lower esophageal sphincter completely on swelling, absence of peristalsis and raised resting pressure in the esophagus and the lower sphincter pressure may be limited but is often normal. And another one is esophagoscopy, that means endoscopy of the upper jet tracts that causing 
whenever you enters into the civic as you looks just you enter suddenly enters into a cave and there is a lot of food materials residue there whenever you suck to out then you difficult to locate the lower end of the civicus and if lower end found it is difficult to negotiate to go into the stomach so that are the findings of the upper jaw endoscopic findings sometimes in the ask in the exam read from the books carefully details of the findings of esophageal esophagus could be findings next one is for diagnosis of esophageal uh, that means echolalia cardia another is a very good investigation tools very simply you can do it where the manometry is not available there in that cases you can diagnose by looking an x ray which is can which can available in, in our city also so one of the patient present to me with a dysphagia along with the bast hepatitis so the bast hepatitis is treated by laparoscopically and after that the patient noticed that he having a dys dysphagia age about 18 years uh 10 to 15 years he having a dysphagia symptoms then i more concentration to the patient and after discharge i ask the patient come again after one month and after that i took the patient to the uh, x-ray uh, diagnostic centers where the digital x-ray is available there and from there i monitor the patient in the monitor with the fluoroscopic view and record it in the mobile that mobile recording video presentation which is called the flu video fluoroscopy in the book written the video fluoroscopy so that fluoroscopy is video done by mobile and this is the pitch uh, video look carefully so there whenever the food materials go in in the esophagus there is no peristalsis is only the food will go down and accommodated there and some amount of barium is passes down no peristalsis concentration look in the videos be careful look carefully the video presentation so this is the findings of the barium swallow appearance is a dilated esophagus with a bird beak appearance pencil tip looks like a pencil tip and it is smooth in outline but in case of malignant lesions the outline is irregular one is really fine there but here it is benign lesion for that is a pencil tip smooth in outline so it is the esophageal manometry so the sensor is put inside the esophagus and the stomach so there is a there is a graphical representations by looking at graphical representations after they can give the information what is the pressure of the lower end of the esophagus is so look it is a endoscopy findings of the upper jaw endoscopy so look the cavity is more wider there is a residual food materials there so that two things can dictate that the patient having obstruction is there either a calicia or there malignancy may be there look the video video fluoroscopy so look the barium is ingested barium mill the barium swallow so look the bolus of food barium again there stay there stay there no peristalsis is there look no peristalsis is sensitive appearance so some amount of barium is passed there and that patient is treated by me laparoscopy helix cardiomyotomy and after two months because the previous one there is surgery there is addition there for for the addition addition resolving i took time two months after two months i do laparoscopically barium swallow uh, that is helix cardiomyotomy after two months of fast hepatic laparoscopy i do again the patient of barium uh, helix cardiomyotomy now the patient young boy is working with his father in the saudi arabia is a well and good now so the treatment is so the treatment of echolalia cardia various options are available in the world in advanced center they do with a minimal invasion that means in the older fashion treatment is the if the lower splinter of the esophagus is forcefully stressed so tear the muscles so dilatation of the lower end 
so the opening is wider the esophagus is empty probably which is called the pomer's pneumatic dilatation put an endoscope through the endoscope put a tube and there is a balloon so the balloon is inflated from the exterior so gradually the balloon is inflated so esophagus is stressed the muscle outside the mucosa become stressed and become tear so there is the opening is wider the patient having a symptom free long time it could be up to 2 years 3 years 4 years but it is not good enough because repeated dilatation causing repeated trauma repeated fibrosis so if you go for the helars cardiac might be subsequently is very difficult to do it for that reason if the patient is fit for surgery don't go for the pneumatic dilatation if unfit patient then you go for the pneumatic dilatation the other sar surgery modified helars cardiomyotomy is we cutting the muscle of the lower end of the esophagus and cardia the, which is shown in the previous video and so lower esophagus system gets relaxed the major complication is gord so whenever there is a relax there is a reflux for that is on simultaneously they do a fundoplication in that case the fundoplication done anteriorly not the posteriorly for for that is on the name of the door fundoplication nowadays gradually the very minimal invasion surgery takes the upper hand which is called the poem near the country india also they are more familiar to do that poem 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 that means par oral endoscopic myotomy it is a very simple technique but the expertise is needed that means throw the esophagus push put endoscope at the middle of the esophagus make an incision in the mucosa go inside the mucosa then cut the muscle fiber up to the fund as uh, near the fund the gastro junction so the whole length of the esophagus is from the middle part is relaxed open up and then the mucosa is closed by endoscope no need any laparoscope no need of any suture material it is very simple technique but it is very complicated and very expertise needed so sub mucosal tunnel is formed in the mid esophagus myotomy is performed that is muscle not the mucosa only the mucosa is tear to some extent then go in and cut the mucosa muscle longitudinally and at the end the mucosal defect is clipped so keep it there and subsequently the clip can uh, oppose to each other and healing of the mucosa another one important thing is botulinum toxin it is also a less invasive procedure that means if you inject the botulinum toxin into the sphincter so it can damage the nerves so the sphincteric contraction is relaxed there is a lot and the esophagus become relaxed and become uh, it is the treatment of achalasia cardia so the botulinum toxin endoscopically injected into the lower esophagus sphincter the effect is not permanent and it has to be repeated after few months and some drugs can help to relax the sphincter calcium channel blockers antagonist nifedipine sublingually given for transit relief of symptoms if definitive treatment is postponed so it is poem par oral endoscopic myotomy look the picture of the videos passing to your stomach this difficulty is caused by two factors one constant spasm of the lower esophageal sphincter muscle and two lack of contractility or push power of the rest of the esophageal muscles a normal esophagus is shown on the left look and a patient with achalasia is shown on the right notice the tightening of the lower esophageal sphincter located between the stomach and the esophagus compare the two there is a peristalsis on the normal side This disorder can be treated utilizing a peroral endoscopic myotomy or POEM. Peroral means entering through the mouth. Endoscopic refers to using an endoscope, and a myotomy involves cutting the muscles that are not functioning properly. The procedure begins by inserting an endoscope or flexible tube with a light and camera through the mouth and into the stomach. An incision is made in the lining of the esophagus. Just mucosa is using a special knife on the tip of the endoscope. The doctor tunnels through the wall of the esophagus. This will allow the doctor to access the muscle layers below. 
To perform the myotomy, the doctor uses the knife on the endoscope to create an incision in the intermuscle layer along the lower portion of the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter, and the upper part of the stomach. The precise cutting of the inner muscle layer relieves the tightness of the sphincter and allows a more natural passage of food from the esophagus to the stomach. After the myotomy is performed, the doctor closes the incision in the lining of the esophagus and the endoscope is removed. So this is about POEM. Now discuss about the carcinoma esophagus. It is also nowadays the incidence more in the previous contest. Very important to know the carcinoma esophagus. Introduction, commonly occurs above the age of 60 years. More commonly, more commonly in men than in the woman. It is important thing one. Carcinoma esophagus is more in case of men. Common sites, 20% in the upper third, 50% in the lower third, and middle part is the 31. So 20, 30, and 50. This is the percentage of incidence. Types of carcinoma esophagus. So clinical classification, that is the, what is the sh shape of the annular type, whenever common in the lower third, ulcerative type, raised departed as necrotic floor, indurated base, in the, usually in the middle part, and coliform type is a fungatic mass is 50% of cases. Histologic classification is two. One is squamosal carcinoma and another adenocarcinoma. Because the esophagus lie, lining in the two third, upper two third is squamous, and lower third is the columnar epithelium. So squamous lining is origin the squamous carcinoma, and columnar lining is transition to adenocarcinoma. So this is about the histological classifications. So commonly it's commercial carcinoma, if it's lower third, it is lower adenocarcinoma. So clinical features. So dysphagia, it is the main one, dysphagia. Solid, first solid, because the gradually the lumen is narrowed. So whenever the solid food bolus is more, then causing obstruction and notice there. And in earlier stage, there is no liquid because the liquid can easily pass in through spaces, through narrow spaces. For that reason, initially solid, then when the lumen is completely occluded, then solid and liquid. The early stages, bags with bronze may present, such as occult blood in the stool, iron deficiency anemia, mild to moderate dysphagia, and mild or intermittent dysphagia, or dysphagia, a foreign body sensation. It is also important to be a foreign body sensation sometimes noticed. In advanced cases, whenever the malignancy go outside the esophagus, so it can infiltrate the surrounding nerves. So their surrounding nerves causing the surrounding nerves symptom presentations. That means whenever the recurrent engine nerve is close to the esophagus, so whenever the recurrent engine nerve is palsy, along with the carcinoma esophagus, it indicates the lesion will go out and go infiltrate the recurrent engine nerve and cause hoarseness of voice. Whenever the patient having a that be Horner syndrome, dropping of the eyelid, due to the involvement of the cervical sympathetic ganglia, the esophagus is lies posteriorly. So in the neck of the first rib, there is a ganglia sympathetic chain there. So whenever the malignant tissue are infiltrated the sympathetic ganglia, so there is a disruption of the communication of the nerve functions and causing the symptom, which is called Horner syndrome. And whenever the chronic spinal nerve pain, that means spinal nerves when are involved, there is a pain in the fixed pain there. And whenever the patient has a diaphragmatic paralysis, so the respiratory problem there, it indicates that the patient may have a phrenic nerve palsy because the phrenic nerve is runs in the mediastinum on two sides of the pericardium. So if in the advanced stage, it may be infiltrated the phrenic nerves and causing the, uh, there, is, there is a paralysis of the diaphragmatic nerve muscle. And weight loss of more than 20% is usually present. And loss of appetite, and some patient may present to you with a lymph node in the neck. So palpable lymph node in the neck in advanced cases. For the reason, in every patient, very important to examine the neck lymph node that can dictate you well, in early stage, in early notice that the patient having neck nodes, though the disease is not early, but is advanced disease, 
you can easily identify that lymph nodes you can easily access easily to investigate the lymph nodes you can do the nature of the lymph node is squamous or adenocarcinoma metastasis by the thing you can easily evaluate then you can do other investigation and then can confirm it why the lymph node is the lesion is esophagus along or not so other investigations are barium swallow so the basic difference between the two is there the defect is a irregular the lining is over the over the barium is lies surface of the malignant tissues there is a irregular surface for that reason it indicates there is a irregular filling defects and it looks like a red tail appearance or at the side where the lumen is protruded the lesion it looks like a shoulder but that is it is called the irregular filling defect with shouldering defect and esophagus could be is a surest confirmatory looking the picture directly you can diagnose there is ulceration and take the biopsy confirm it by esophageal examination and for evaluation the resectability it these are nowadays not required it is, is called previously done for thoracoscopy laparoscopy for evaluation the uh, evaluation the resectability but nowadays the investigation like chest x ray mri ct they can easily pet scan can evaluate the resectability no need to go for thoracoscopy or laparoscopy for evaluation of resectability and for staining investigations needed to do if facility available endoscopic ultrasonography C C T contrast and a CT scan of the chest and chest X-ray of the lungs, ultrasound of the whole abdomen to exclude the liver metastasis, lymph node metastasis, etc. Bone scan for bone metastasis and brain CT scan to exclude the brain metastasis. Laboratory investigation is a supportive one. There is an ulceration, loss of blood, so there is a chronic iron deficiency anemia and occult blood test in stools, tumor marker C E A and C A fifteen three may dictate you to some extent the patient may be a malignancy. And another one is positron emission tomography. Positron emission tomography. It is the investigation to diagnose the malignancy, what is the primary and what are the secondaries. Whole body survey can done by PET scan. PET scan, positron emission tomography. It is non-invasive method of dictating primary, nodal, distant metastasis, and locally recurrent tumors. And the technique estimates the area of high glucose metabolism, the tumor, and by measurement of radio tracer by fluorodeoxyglucose, FGA. That, by that technique, they can measure the metabolism of the glucose, the malignant tissue, the glucose metabolism high. With tracing that, they can evaluate where are the lesions of malignant cells are there, it easily evaluated by doing a PET scan. So look the X-ray irregular filling defect, irregular filling defect there. So this is called the shouldering, shoulder effect. This this the lumen is just like a shoulder for the shoulder effect. Look at the picture. In the lower end, there is a ulcerated lesions. In the lower end of the esophagus, and esophagus is dilated to some extent. The most likely adenocarcinoma. Whenever it is biopsy, then confirm it adenocarcinoma. So these are the TNM staging. So spread to the carcinoma esophagus, direct to the surroundings. Lymphatics mainly in the downward direction, cervical esophagus, lower deep cervical lymph nodes, thoracic esophagus, paraesophageal thoracobronchial lymph nodes. Abdominal esophagus, lymph nodes along the lesser curvature of the stomach in the celiac axis. And blood rare, it may go to the liver, lung, bone, brain. These are the staging of the TNM staging. So treatment. Treatment in inoperable cases, do a palliative surgery. So palliative surgery means you can do some, relieve the symptoms to some extent and localize the disease process as far as possible. So for the localization, they can prescribe some chemo radiation. So it can decrease the tumor size to some extent, to decrease the symptom to some extent, but does not cure the disease. That means, or sometimes some palliation, the lumen is occluded by the tumor masses. So the tumor tissue is ablated by the laser, laser ablation and causing the tunnel, there is a lumen expanding, then put a stand there. So the stand can prevent 
the melanin tissue migrated inside the lumen so that stent can functioning after six or one year the patient can take meal with through the natural basis and photodynamic therapy intubation pharyngeal genostomy or gastrostomy so whenever the patient is not inoperable so the patient is not possible to do any feed to through the esophagus so if you put a tube below the diaphragm in the stomach of the jejunum so through the tube they can feed and survive to some extent so among the jejunostomy and gastrostomy among these two the jejunostomy is better because whenever the food materials enters into the stomach there is a reflex reflux salivation so this saliva go into the esophagus in the upper part of studded part there is a more salivation stasis there and causing more discomfort to the patient the patient having more choking more respiration for that reason it is feasible to do a jejunostomy but the jejunostomy is difficult gastrostomy easier but most of the surgeons they do the gastrostomy very very simple one but in case of jejunostomy they need to do tunneling and make a tubes then pull it out and make a tube connection so which is called the feeding jejunostomy so this is the basic difference sometime ask in the exam why you don't choose the gastrostomy why you choose the jejunostomy this is the answer one in case of operable cases the operability depends upon the staging of the disease and local infiltration etc so radical surgery can cure the patient long time so in the upper third of the esophagus whenever there is a malignancy the treatment of choice is total esophagectomy that means you total esophagus is removed and esophagus is replaced by the stomach so that name of the operation is called the three stage mckeon operation mckeon operation three stage means there is a three one for abdomen operation first then go for the chest open esophagus is mobilized then you make an incision then on the left side of the neck and the guard is excised the esophagus stomach is pulled up and anastomosis is the neck for that is it is called the three stage mckeon operation but nowadays to some extent earlier stages they are only by the two stages by the trans hiatal esophagectomy that means through the hiatus laparoscopically or manually with the blunt hand finger introduce through the hiatus and mobilize the esophagus from below and up make an incision in the neck surround the esophagus mobilization and after dividing the stomach mobilization the stomach then the stomach is pulled up it is called trans hiatal esophagectomy but in case of middle third of the esophagus there is a two stage ivor lewis operation that means you divide the part of the esophagus then the stomach is migrated up and an astomosis in the chest with the esophagus which is called the partial esophagectomy esophago gastrectomy and in case of lower third there is a subtotal esophagal gastrectomy with appropriate lymph node dissection reconstructions in that cases may be anastomosis done with the jejunum so after esophagectomy always there is a pyloroplasty or a pyloromyotomy is performed to prevent postoperative gastric diastasis as both vagus have inevitably been divided it is very important thing always memorize it so in case of gastric surgery esophageal surgery the patient needs to pyloroplasty or pyloromyotomy for prevention of gastric stasis so criteria of inoperability of carcinoma esophagus indication of palliative treatment when the patient is general condition is unfit presence of distal metastasis unresectable tumors infiltration of important structures like trachea or aorta so that can evaluate by the ct scan previously they do first the is a uh, endoscopy of the trachea first look then is there any infiltration then go for surgery but nowadays it is not needed because all the investigation are available ct scan mri can evaluate easily differentiate is there any infiltration or not 
Prognosis of carcinoma is is very bad due to most of the patients are present with elderly patient, old age, bad general condition before operation, and early local spread, high morbidity after operation, like emphyma, leakage, for stomosis. Both of, of them causing the prognosis bad. What about this stricture esophagus? It is the last one, stricture. It means narrowing of the lumen of the esophagus. So that is esophagus, it may be malignant, it may be benign. So that are the causes of esophageal stricture like GORD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, like the same. Reflux, there is a acid exposure to the mucosa, ulceration, healing, scarring, and narrowing. Post-inflammation, causing narrowing. Post-radiation, so radiation causing inflammation, narrowing. Post-endoscopic mucosal resection or leather resection. In that case, there is a healing and causing the scarring and narrowing. Post-surgical, like isovago, gastric anastomosis, there is a So, some caustic agent. Nowadays, it is more familiar, the herpic ingestion causing nowadays more ingestion as cases of the isovagus because isovagal is stitcher. And whenever some herpic go down to the stomach, there is a pyrospasm. So, retention within the stomach, more exposure to the herpic there, more burning there. So the patient is really present with stitcher in the subacus, along with the stitcher in the pyloric end. So the patient present a gastric outer obstruction with the subacus stitcher also. May be present. For that reason, evaluation is needed before doing the subacus surgery, whatever the lower condition is. If there is a lower condition, that part also needed to surgery. Otherwise, the patient don't able to eat after doing the subacus surgery. Some medication. It is very important thing is, Elendoronate, tetracycline, doxycycline, mycophenolate, hemopathic, hemopathic pills, and NSAIDs. Those agents which causing the esophageal strictures, for prevention of esophageal ulceration strictures, always prescribe the individual, take the medication with the full stomach, that means Whenever the heavy meal is taken, at the middle of the meal, the drug is taken. Otherwise, there is a stasis of the dye, a uh, stasis of the med medicine in the esophagus, and it become open up the capsule, and subsequently there is, is esophagitis, there is ulcers. For that reason, be cautious to prescribe and advise the patient, take the medicine with the middle of the meal, with heavy meal, and after take medication, the patient must take enough amount of drinking water and don't lie in the bed immediately after taking the medication. This thing can prevent the esophageal ulceration and stitcher formation. The other disease, systemic disease, is connective tissue disorder is scleroderma. So the clinical patients are almost the, all the same of esophageal obstruction symptoms, stasis, esophagitis, that means heartburn, dysphagia, nutrient deficiency, regurgitation, and regurgitation causing aspiration, aspiration symptoms, etc. Investigation is very simple, barium solum, esophagoscopy, and CT scan. That can easily evaluate. Now, what is the lesion of the stitcher is? Treatment. So, in case of benign stitcher, you can go for the dilatation. In case of malignant stitchers, you need for surgical treatment. So, in some cases, may go for the stenting. So, stenting causing scar tissue grow inside the stand, so it can maintain the patency of the esophagus. The patient can easily take milk. And after dilatation, you always advise the patient, don't take any sorts of fruits who having a peel or who having an intake like a, like, uh, like a bean like bin. So if you take a bin, some, uh, the capsule is so thick that there is a stay over the side of stitcher and long time it can remain there. It's difficult the patient presented with a complete dysphagia subsequently. So for that reason, some advice given uh, whenever a patient having a stitcher dilatation then. In case of conservative treatment fails, then need to surgery. So that surgery is, so whenever the stitcher, the esophagus needs to remove. So remove the esophagus, excise the esophagus. So it is, it is represent, that means replaced 
by an another part of the body. It means in case of esophagus, you can remove the esophagus. So the esophagus is replaced by the transverse colon. So you cut the transverse colon with the vascularity and go up. The muscular pedicle remains there, attached with the esophagus upper end and the stomach. So the esophagus is replaced by the transverse colon and the foot metals go through the esophagus to the transverse colon to the stomach. And both cut and the transverse colon is stitches there. So there is a continuation. The gut can easily functioning there. So this is a colonic, colonic interposition. That colonic interposition is done in case of benign lesion to some extent sometimes. Don't go through the mediastina. It is very simple. Just make an incision in the abdomen and come it out and passes through the tunnel in front of the sternum and go to the neck. So whenever the patient ingested, the foot metals can easily be seen down through beneath the skin. It also can possible subcutaneous tunneling and interposition of the esophagus and connected to the above, up and down. So this is called colonic transposition, interposition. And whenever the mid esophagus, it is a, in case of upper esophagus, when the mid esophagus, in the case of jejunum, may segment of jejunum may interpose and astromus the stomach with the esophagus. Sometimes in a very low end structure, benign structure, you cut and the stomach can mobilize and go up and make an anastomosis. What about the esophageal perforation? So perforation can occur by spontaneous or by disease process or by some factors that means direct trauma. So iatrogenic perforation may occur in case of endoscopic manipulation, usually not due to the endoplexible, it is rigid esophagus to be used, in that case it may occur. Spontaneous perforation or borever syndrome, the patient having a more cough, more vomiting, more cough there, so that coughing, sneezing, causing, there is a force, if the is closed, more pressure in the esophagus, the esophagus is ruptured, and the air is leaked to the mediastinum, go to the neck, there is surgical emphysema. And some pathological perforation, like vascular perforation with ulcer or the tumor, malignant case, in that case, may perforation occurs. For antibodies, it is very important thing. In case of denture, Whenever the single teeth denture having a hook to held up the teeth in the surrounding teeth for that reason. So whenever it accidentally enters inside the mouth, so it goes down, the projected end of the wire is up. So if you remove with the endoscope, so there is a chance of tearing the perforation of the esophagus. It is very important. Or if the patient having a meat bone, there is a pointed end, if you remove forcefully to out, in that case, there is a chance of perforation of the esophagus. It is very dangerous. What about the <coughs> penetrating injury? The penetrating injury by knives or the bullet <coughs> is uncommon even in war because the esophagus is relatively small target surrounding by other vital organs. And caustic burn, that means some chemicals causing burning and it becomes more softer and causing the perforation. So esophageal perforation, clinical presentation is severe pain in the chest or upper abdomen after a meal or bout of drinking. Subclinic empysema, Hammond's sign, it means crunching sound hard in precordia of due to subclinic empysema. Vomiting, retching, associated shortness of the breath may be present. Features of shock may be present. On examination, rigidity in the upper abdomen, even in absence of any peritoneal contamination may be present. Chest X-ray is a diagnostic so we are in the mediastinum, um, pleura or peritoneum. It is confirmatory. Barium contrast, contrast is a barium swallow, but it is, there is not barium swallow. If there is suspicions, always go for the water soluble contrast gastrographin. Because the barium is if swallow, the barium is leaked to the mediastinum um, and causing more harm. For that reason, water soluble contrast and a contrast is done, then gastrographin. So that if the contrast is exacerbated from the lumen to the mediastinum, um, that indicates generally there is a Perforations. A CTS scan also shows the medicinal or extra luminal air. Treatment repair of the perforation according to the site and status of the patient. So, another two important short notes in the exam, <coughs> particularly in the postgraduate, there is two terminologies the bore ever syndrome 
and the Meloni V syndrome. Though it is a V, the spelling is V, but here it is written W. Be careful about it. The Meloni V syndrome, W E I W S. So, bore head syndrome, it is tearing, it is tear in the lower third of the esophagus, which occurs when a person vomits against a closed glottis, leading to increased pressure in the esophagus, causing leak in the medicinum, pleural cavity, and peritoneum. So, clinical features are macular stride, vomiting, chest pain, subcutaneous emphysema. And Hemen signs crunching sound hard in the pericardium due to the subcutaneous emphysema. Investigation chest x ray, treatment conservative management at first, nothing may mouth, IV fluids, TPN, feeding by dizziness. Or most often surgery by resection may be required. When severe medicinitis occurs, the condition has highly mortality, highly motile. Mallory bees, the mucosal tear in the esophago gastric junction. The basic difference is here is the lower third esophagus perforation. The esophagus tear in the lower third. Here it is gastroesophageal junction. But here only the mucosa is tear. That is cardiac and the stomach due to forceful vomiting. 90% cases occur in the cardia, but 10% cases may occur in the esophagus. Patient usually present with hematemesis. Only conservative management as it is only a mucosal tear and tears usually self-healing without any intervention within several days and bleeding stops within few hours. Medications such as PPI and antimatic may be given. In case of severe bleeding, injection of hemostatic agents like mesopressin or endoscopic sclerotherapy, injection may be required. So in a nutshell, what are the findings of barium swallow? In echolysia cardia, there is a dilated esophagus with barred wick appearance of the teeth, lower end. Long standing cases, it becomes sigma esophagus. But in case of CA esophagus, irregular filling defect in the red tail appearance. Diffuse esophageal spasm, there is a cork screw appearance. This looks, it is a cork screw. There is a spasm, diffuse spasm. Looks like a cork screw. And structure is a smooth outline, narrowing in the lumen of the esophagus. Hydrous hernia, cetuscale ring may be present, concentric mucosal narrowing at the junction. GORD shows reflux of dye when done in tender and wide position. Gastric reflux is diagnosed, X ray, barium swallow, and meal done in a tender position. The dye is passed in the esophagus, then it is called GORD. So, thank you, everybody, or thank you for patience hearing the details about the esophageal diseases. Though the esophagus is 25 centimeters length, but it's a very interesting, very interesting subject. So, if you learn very meticulously, you can memorize a lot of things. You can practice, it is helpful in your practice in subsequent life. So, our next clinical sessions. After Eid holiday, uh, 28th May on Thursday at 10 p.m., the next session will be held on stomach and its diseases. So now the session is open for question and answer session. Do you have any question? You can ask. Islam, I'm sorry, sir. Islam? Sir, is there any chance of developing gastroesophageal reflux disease after doing paroral endoscopic myomectomy in case of echolysia cardia? Yes, it may be, but whenever the hiatus is normal, in case of echolysia cardia, the esophageal hiatus, which is formed by the right cross of the diaphragm, is it normal there? So there is a less chance of development of after I, I, POM. There is less chance of development of reflux. But there is the every possibility. If there is the every possibility, if there is a development of the POM uh, reflux, in that case, yes, subsequently go for the leprosy fund application, uh, additional leprosy fund application if the symptom is severe. But okay. if the esophageal hiatus is normal, in that case, there is less chance. So, any more question? I'm concerned. Aslam? Uh, how can we differentiate uh, the benign esophageal structure in the lower end of esophagus and echolysia cardia? Yes, in case of echolysia cardia, there is a no structure. The splinter is tight. So, whenever you introduce the 
endoscope, you can equally easily evaluate it is a stitcher or is it a normal constriction of the sphincteris, more pressure constriction of it is one. Another thing is if you do and barium may swallow, in case of achalasia cardia, there is a pencil tip appearance and but in case of stitcher, there is a not like say pencil tip appearance. One. The typical findings, pencil tip appearance or barbic appearance is a favor of a cardia. By the two things you can evaluate, is it a stitcher or is it a achalasia cardia? And endoscopy is mandatory in all cases of esophageal disease because sometimes the patient having a double pathology. Carcinoma esophagus may associate it with a achalasia cardia. Or carcinoma stomach may associate it with a achalasia cardia. For that reason, before going for surgical treatment, Always mandatory to do an endoscopy of the upper theater. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any more? Sir, Assalamu alaikum. Aslam. Sir, we all know that all types of hernia can recur, uh, recur after repair. In case of esophageal diseases like uh, hard, uh, sliding hernia or any other disease, we do fund obligation. So, yes. which fund, my question is, which fund obligation is more? Uh, appropriate uh, to prevention of uh, <clears throat> recurrence or what measure should be taken? Yes. Nation fund application is a complete circle of the esophagus by the stomach. So in that case, if the lower end of the esophagus is not capable to go up, always there is a prevention of esophagus migration by the crust because the stomach is held up the esophagus. So it is the best one. Nation fund application. But Sometimes the esophageal it is height is so large that it is not capable to held up the stomach draping after fundoplication stay in the abdomen. In that cases, you must along with fundoplication, there must be put a mesh surrounding the esophagus, fixed it with the diaphragm, the chest abdominal wall. It can prevent the hiatal defect closer migration. So it can easily maintain inside the abdomen. One is fundus fund application, another one is the mesh. The mesh repair can also prevent further protection. So it is a more safer where the more uh, hiatus of the esophagus is more dilated. In that cases, sometimes they put some mesh there. Okay. Am I clear? G sir. G sir, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any more question? So thank you everybody for thank you for patience hearing. So now we can end the session here. Thank you.